Father, we come before you. We thank you for your word. <clears throat> Man, it's like I said last weekend. It's like we're living dog years one weekend at a time. Just trying to keep up. Last week, Europe made it pretty clear they're against Christ. This week, the Middle East has made it pretty clear they're coming against Israel. God only knows what next week brings. But our eyes are on you. And as our brother shared with us, you've placed us among co-workers, neighbors, family members, and others. So why are we here? Help us to be bright lights for you. Help us, Lord, as these things begin to unfold, to be ready to give a reason for the hope within us. More than ever, may the church truly be filled with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, This I say then, <clears throat> walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, they're obvious. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, we went through these all last week, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envying, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I have told you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which continually practices the idea, these things or such things, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, the idea of humility, temperance, self-control, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's, and I will ask you again, if you're Christ's, raise your hand. Like, why does he do this? It's like class participation. Why does he do this to us? Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father which is in heaven. I don't know about you, but I want to be confessed as his before his Father in heaven. I know my answer is, I have no right to be here, but I'm with him. And he said, if I own him down here as my Savior, he owns me there as his son. So I'm in. No shame in that. They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. And that's a moment-by-moment -moment battle. If we live in the Spirit, what does that mean? If we live in the Spirit. God is not looking for religious people. He's looking for people who desire a relationship with him. He created Adam and Eve not because he was lonely, but that he desired fellowship with them. You know the account. If you don't, now you know what to do with your week. Read Genesis 1. He's not looking for employees. He's looking for worshipers. So a life that is spent walking in the Holy Spirit is a life where, as I've surrendered my life to Jesus and asked his forgiveness, I now seek to ask for God's help from his Holy Spirit so that I can be found in his love, his joy, his peace, his gentleness, his goodness, these other beautiful attributes of God working in your life, which is, was shared with us by our brother there, how this, this lady watching him play ping pong said, what's with you people? That work of the Holy Spirit. When I am challenged to walk in or work in adultery, fornication, uncleanness, fits of anger, wrath, bitterness, etc., these works of the flesh, when that battle is happening in my life, the way to live in the Spirit is to ask the Holy Spirit to help me not do those things. You know what I mean. You're, you, wherever it happens, you, you're in the kitchen trying to do something or you're out trying to do something in the house or the yard or you know, clean up one of the kids' bedrooms or whatever. And you know when you have like that convergence of annoyance? <clears throat> Never mind, I guess it's just me. And you feel yourself like... <clears throat> 
Boom. You're like, you're like, that's it. You know, I'm like, I'm having fish tonight. To quote Finding Nemo, right? And you feel yourself going down that path that will only do damage. That's when you cry out. James, or John warned us, you know, you, you have not because you ask not. James. John says, when we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Jesus said, ask, it'll be given to you. Lord, right now I'd really like to freak out and lose my mind, but that's not going to help myself, my kids, my wife, or whatever, my coworkers, wherever the case may be. Lord, would you please fill me with your Holy Spirit? Would you please give me love instead of anger? Would you please give me whatever? And he'll help you. That's what life is living in the Spirit. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit in a relationship with Him, bringing our burdens to Him. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, or envying one another, but rather, verse, chapter 6, verse 1, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a peritoma, you try it, misstep, a fault. If a man be overtaken in a fault, Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one. Now, you're already waiting for me in Hebrews 12. I'm going to catch up. Hebrews 12. Here in chapter 12, he said, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. What witnesses? Go to Hebrews 11:13. 13. These all died in faith. The ones listed in Hebrews 11 who followed the Lord in their different circumstances. These all died in faith, not having received the promises. They died knowing they couldn't save themselves. They died knowing there would be a redeemer, the seed of the woman. They died knowing it had to be God who could make them right to be with him. They died in faith knowing there would be a redeemer. We die in faith knowing his name. His name is Jesus of Nazareth. He is the redeemer. But we're both looking to the same work of God, where God will send someone to make a way so that in spite of our sins, we can be right with him. These all died in faith. It has to be God. Not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, there would be a redeemer, as Job said. We are persuaded of them and embrace them. They confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So that cloud of witnesses who went before us, who knew that it would have to be God. So back to chapter 12, wherefore seeing we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses who all died in faith. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. He's writing to the church. We can carry things that are a waste of time and a poor use of our, our opportunities in front of us. There's also times where we pick up a sin that we really shouldn't be involved in. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, some days easier than others. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us, as was asked, why are you here? Looking unto Jesus, the author and the, what's next? What's next? What's next? Finisher. As it says elsewhere, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it, right? Today of Christ Jesus, will be faithful to complete it. He's the finisher. Just abide and you'll bear fruit. The Lord is with you, not against you. Just abide. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy, what joy? That you would believe his word, you would ask his forgiveness, and by the power of his Holy Spirit, you would turn from your sins and begin to live a life that's different for him. For the joy that was set before him, and during the cross, which I deserve and you deserve, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, there's no worry about what November is going to bring, or other political issues, he's at the right hand of the ruler of heaven and earth. So don't panic. Back to chapter 6. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, it happens. We make a misstep, we get 
bamboozled by something, we go places we know we shouldn't be. If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, and that's not, woo hoo hoo, look who's so spiritual. It's those who are walk, walking rightly with him. Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Look, if someone says, yeah, I went to this website, it really messed me up. Don't go to the website. If someone says, yeah, I read this book, and it was, you know, I thought it was good, and then it was, don't get the book. They'll be like, well, wow, that is bad. You don't, seriously? Consider yourself, right? Beware, lest you also be tempted. And the idea of you which are spiritual, those who are alongside trying to walk rightly with God. See, as was shared by our brother, why is it important to be among the body of believers, or why is it important we, you know, we have a new plant or a plant that's been going in Pottstown. They just got a building, you know. Why is it important to be in Bible study groups or whatever? Because then you're with other people. And they can tell if something's going on in your world life. They get to know you over time. They, you know, they'll say, you good? Because they can see something's not good. By the way, for those in marriage, I've learned there's two different ways to say you're good. One is, you're good? That, mm -hmm. So try this. Baby, you good? That's when that helps. Yeah, yeah. And vice versa. Those are clapping know exactly what I'm talking about. That being alongside other believers. You're not alone. And it's going to get weird. You're not alone. You who are spiritual among the... And that's why these things are important. Bible studies, home fellowships, groups, getting together with people. Ye that are spiritual in the spirit of meekness, restore such a one, considering yourself, lest thou also be tempted. Call them back to what's right. Bear ye one another's burdens. That word bear is bastazo. Ye another one, one another's burdens. That's baros. Say baros or baros. Okay, that's heavy object or difficulty or, or burden is the idea. Bear ye one another's burdens. James says, confess your faults one to another. In chapter 5, pray for one another. You may be healed. Someone comes in, something terrible is going on within their family or their grandkids or their job or whatever it may be, and you can tell something's up. Something's up. You guys get to interact way more with the people of the church than I do. I get a couple conversations, try to get what I can, and you guys have got people all around you. If you see their hearts heavy, like, hey, what's going on? I just got laid off. Let's pray for you. God's the provider. That's body ministry. So when someone comes in and you can see their burden, that's, hey, can you pray for me? Here's what's happening. Great. Bear one another's burdens is the idea. And so fulfill the law of Christ. What law of Christ? Love your neighbor as yourself. Wonderful. For if a man thinketh himself to be something when he is nothing... He deceiveth himself, and that's a classic problem throughout the scriptures of people who became something only to become nothing, like King Saul. He deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work. The idea is prove with testing. Then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. So every man shall bear his own burden, or for every man shall bear his own burden. Well, Pastor Chris, Pastor Chris. Yeah. I've heard the Bible's full of contradictions. Oh, really? So give me one right here. By the way, just an aside, do you know what happens when you have a couple little boys unsupervised with uh, either a rock or a ball in their hand? <laughs> that. So if you're wondering, nobody tried to come in and steal your Bibles. We, as I look out at the little window, I want to let you know that we weren't under assault or siege. It's just a couple little dudes that learned about physics. <laughs> Isn't that exciting? You're just trying to deflect from the, from the possible contradiction. No, I'm not. Bastazo baros. Say it. Okay. Then try bastazo fortin. Are they the same? No. Both are bearing something. But baros is a heavy weight. Fortin or fortin, P-H-O-R-T-I-O-N, fortin, is basically a, a burden or responsibility. We all have, I think, electric bills to pay. You all have people in your home to feed. You all have tires to put on your cars to get through Pennsylvania inspection and all the other things, right? We all have those things. And sometimes it, you can have circumstances happen. You get sick, 
company folds, whatever it may be, and you're in a place of sudden need, and, and there are abilities here to help people with those kind of needs. The elders and deacons sit with them, pray with them, find out what's going on, and will respond in some sort of fashion, right? Because, okay, something bad just happened. Fine, got it. But generally speaking, all of you paid your income tax or your real estate tax or whatever other things you're dealing with. You're bearing your own responsibility. Does that make sense? So, we're to bear one another's heavy burdens, the idea of things that are troubling or oppressive weight. However, each man is responsible for their own car payment, obligation, etc. Two different words. So next time someone says, yeah, 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 that's two different words. Here's the problem. You pay your own electric bill, but how can I pray for you? Problem solved. Just took a little Greek. Let him that is taught in the word, that'd be you guys, Communicate unto him that teacheth. That word is koinio, to have things in common or share. Communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Now, he's writing to the churches of Galatia. He's encouraging them to support financially those who are not the false teachers, but the genuine teachers coming through so they can do their ministry. This verse, in many ways, I don't really need to spend any time on because you guys have understood this for the entire time we've been at church, you know we never take an offering. And we have never been short. I'm short, but we've never been short. <laughs> Met a nice couple, like, yeah, you're shorter than we thought. Met them today. It's all good. It breaks the ice. So I, I have, look, I, I accept that I, never mind. I get emails. How tall are you? Because I'm trying to figure out if I'm short. <laughs> like, I've become the measure. You guys have been so faithful. So there's no need to talk about it. I mean, you figured out where the box in the back is, and we've done a lot for missions. You guys don't know this, but in the last year or two years, you guys have helped some other churches get established that basically found they, they suddenly had a problem, so you guys helped them. So you have been so faithful, it's not only taking care of the needs here within the congregation and of missionaries and others, but you guys have been so faithful, we've been able to bless other congregations who found themselves suddenly with a major problem. Well done. Let him that is taught communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Now verse 7, be not deceived. And that's a difficult thing. We have two deceives here in this chapter. Verse 3, he deceiveth himself. That is one of the hardest places to deal with someone when you do try to come alongside and you see them caught up in a misstep and you start talking to them about, look, you know, I think this is wrong. And they say, oh no, I deserve to have this woman in my affair. Are you kidding me? They deceive themselves. And that Satan loves that. When you start deceiving yourself, he can go move on. Leave it to yourself. So that's the first warning. He deceives himself. That's a terrible place to be. Second one is thinking God's word isn't true. Verse 7, be not deceived. Let astray, the word is plano, to fly or lead away. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Boy, is that timely in light of last week's opening ceremonies, which I didn't watch, but I got snippets. Keep an eye on Europe. We'll see what... <laughs> Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man or a nation soweth, that shall he also reap. You sow anger, bitterness, fornication, hatred, idolatry, uncleanness, drunkenness, ravings, and all these other things. It's only a matter of time. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Meanwhile, you sow love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, self-control, a submission or humility to God, meekness, you'll reap. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Meanwhile, the Middle East thinks they're going to wipe out Israel and their God. They're, they're in for a day of reckoning. Stay tuned. Pop the popcorn because it's going to get weird. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. It's very simple. But he that soweth to the spirit, what do you mean? Asking for his help. Lord, right now I want to lose my mind. Well, here, I'll give it back to you. <laughs> Lord, right now I want to give him a piece of my mind. Here, I'll help you with your cage and your lips to not do that. 
that relationship with God. Let us not be weary then. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. Not to mention some people who end up in heaven with you because they watch Jesus working through you. Let us not be weary in well-doing. Am I the only one once in a while finding myself getting a bit tired of what's going on around us? Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So, run with endurance. As we have therefore opportunity, you have many of them if you look, take a look, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. And that again comes to where there's a time of need for assistance. You see how large a letter I've written unto you with my own hand. By the way, parchment is expensive. This is why they would hire guys to write things and Paul would dictate because his writing's probably kind of like mine, which my kids tell me have never grown up with my artwork. I have, but my handwriting hasn't. Haley de has basically determined my handwriting should be a font. <laughs> Just want to let you know how it goes in my house. If somebody ever gets my Bible, they'll go, I didn't know any hieroglyphics. <laughs> As we have opportunity, therefore, let us do good unto all men, especially them of the household of faith. So you see how large a letter I've written unto you with my own hand. Paul is authenticating the letter. This is Paul. He's authenticating it. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, these legalistic false teachers, they constrain, that's to compel by force, they constrain you to be circumcised. Just a little reminder, at this time, Judaism in the Roman Empire is legal. It's allowed. Christianity is illegal. One way to try and get a little heat off your back is act like you're Jewish when you're maybe not. As many as desire to make a show in the flesh, they circumcise, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh, that their group is growing, is the idea. Look at their leading. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is Jesus' death and resurrection that changed my life. How about you? That's where the power comes from to live a godly life. He broke the power of death and sin. God forbid I should glory in anything save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me. You know, it really doesn't have much, does it? And I unto the world it's lost its grip. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision availeth anything is the idea, but a new creature. How do I become a new creature? You ask the Holy Spirit for help. And he'll change you. And as was said with the ping pong club there, and people will notice. And now you get to share with them. A new creature. As many as walk according to this rule, being a new creature by walking in the spirit. Peace beyond them. And mercy. And upon the Israel of God. Okay, little side journey here. Today, is the church completely Jewish? Some of you are like, is this a trick question? Good, you're shaking your head, no, I think Matt, well done. No, we're Gentiles and Jews. Acts chapter two, day of Pentecost. Was the church, if not completely, like 99.9% .9 Jewish? Yes. So there are Jews who are followers of Christ. Now we have modern terms for it, but they were just Christians, believers in Jesus. He's the Messiah. There are Gentiles who are followers of Christ. When he's talking about the Israel of God, he's talking about those Jews who have left their legalism to follow Jesus as their redeeming savior. In other words, they're not only Jewish, they're true believers in Christ. That's who he's talking about. So don't get weird with that with some of the theology that's out there either. These are Jews who are following Jesus. From henceforth, let no man trouble me, although he probably had it till the end. For I bear, there's that word bastazo, I carry. I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus, three times beaten with rods, five times getting 39 lashes, getting shipwrecked and stoned with stones. This guy had some serious road wear on his body. I bear in my body the marks of... You got these false teachers coming through like, oh, we've got to keep the law. 
And they run for the hills when there's trouble. Paul shows up. He's been, I mean, the ugly stick has just had it with him because he won't back down and say Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He's like, stop hassling me. Get in line. Everybody else has beat me, and I'm still standing for Jesus. Love that. He's going to be an interesting dude. Hope he's short. Brethren, (laughs) the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Those who didn't think we'd ever finish the book said, let's stand and pray. (laughs) Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your love and mercy. Lord, we come before you and we are watching. you, You told us, blessed are our eyes. We are seeing the things the prophets long to see. It's hard to keep up, Lord. Last week, Europe's calling out for the Antichrist. This week, the Middle East is calling out for trying to wipe Israel off the map. Lord, it's just, what's next week? We pray, Father God, you would strengthen your church. I think we're entering the stadium and seeing the final lap. Let us run it with joy. Help us to be so brightly burning, Lord, in spite of the fact we fight the world, our flesh, and the devil. May there be such a joy, such a peace, such a love among your people that, Lord, people ask us, what is, your, what is going on? And we can finally get that last few Gentiles in the net and go home. So, Lord, I pray for your church. Strengthen them. May it be our finest hour, Lord, in spite of our flesh and the weights that beset us. Where the name of Jesus is lifted up. Lord, I lift up anyone here who doesn't know you. It may be the news this week brought them here. You have already known them. If that's you, just right where you stand, ask Jesus to forgive your sins. Ask him to come into your heart as your Lord and your Savior. Ask him to change your life through the Holy Spirit. And he will hear you. And you will leave here a new creature. Thank you for the work you're doing in the midst of your church. In Jesus' name, amen.